Hello, everyone. We're just waiting. Um, this is Kelly Eversoul. We're just waiting just a few more minutes to let everyone get added to the webinar this morning. All right, well, let's get underway. So again, I'm Kelly Eversoul, the Executive Director of National Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, and I'm pleased to be here today to uh, introduce our webinar. This is uh, one of a, a number of webinars that we've been hosting, and we have a, a full program for the rest of the year. Let me try to get my... Yeah. Sorry for the delay. I've got a problem with my with advancing. So the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium has uh, almost 3,000 members. We've continued to grow, and I'd like to make a special thank you to all of our sponsors who are in fact making this possible. Uh, it we would not be able to do this webinar if it were not for our sponsors, and uh, so I want to thank BASF, Lima Grain, Syngenta. Florimon Dupre, Kansas Wheat, INRA, RAGT, the University of Adelaide, and Syngenta, if I didn't mention them before. So thank you. Um, the IWGSC's vision 2.0 is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular traits or the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. Our activities also include trying to expand the IWGSC Arbor Biosciences collaboration. Um, we are in the process of trying to put together both a publication and uh, gap closure of version 1.0 of reference uh, RefSec version 1.0. We're in the process now of actually uh, increasing the annotation, doing both manual and functional annotation of version 2.0 and what may become version 2.1. We hope this year to start our wheat diversity project uh, where we will sequence at least eight land races representing the breadth of, of wheat diversity. And then of course, push for pre-publication releases of genome sequences for elite wheat varieties and any other uh, genomic resources that come along. Uh, we feel that we were fortuitous to have had the webinar uh, tools in place to be able to launch our webinar series this year, so it's it's worked out really well for us. So our uh, before we get started on today's, I'd like to mention that our next webinar will be on the 29th of June, and it will be the multiple genome assemb assemblies uh, project that the 10 G so called 10 genome plus project uh, that and C Curtis Posniak from University of Saskatchewan will be presenting this project and giving us the update on that. You can register either on our IWGSC website or you can register uh, by the link that will be available on the presentations and all of the presentations will be available on our our website. So the, just to give you all an idea, the webinar um, will be recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC's YouTube channel uh, within a few days. It takes a little bit of time for them to process the, uh, the video, but then it will be uh, available and can be listened to by anyone without uh, any registration or anything. The presentation, we'll have a presentation section and then it will be followed by Q&A. And you can see on the, your dashboard, there's a little link that says submit your questions uh, or a Q&A. Uh, use that, do not use the chat button because we don't tend to read that during the uh, presentation. And if you need to talk to either one of the other panelists or to the organizers, then use the chat and uh, someone will get back to you in that regard. You can download all the handouts uh, from the presentations in, in actually the panel. And so, um, you know, don't hesitate to do that. And finally, so for today, <clears throat> I'm very pleased 
to uh, have Reiner Meltzer and Suzanne Schilling, who are both from the University of College of Dublin, and they are going to be talking with us about genome-wide analysis of a weak transcription factor family and the power that they are being able to apply with the use of bioinformatics resources. So I'm going to turn it over now to, to Reiner and Suzanne. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to a great webinar. Thank you, Kelly, for uh, this introduction. So we we are plant developmental biologists and our main interest is in understanding how genes determine phenotypes, uh, how genes control development and also how genes contribute to domestication. Now, uh, if, if we want to understand uh, what is driving domestication, we could probably try to classify the genes or proteins that contribute to domestication in three broad groups. Not going to be perfect, of course, but I think it helps uh, uh, for, for understanding uh, the concept. And the three uh, broad groups um, uh, are enzymes or structural proteins. Those are sometimes called superheroes. Uh, then some traits uh, that are important during domestication are really controlled not by one master regulator, but uh, by numerous, numerous genes collectively. And we term those minions. And the third category that is important are transcription factors. And we term this category the masterminds. So why, why are transcription factors important? Because they regulate the activity of other genes. They can upregulate or, or, or repress other genes. And with this, by uh, mutations in transcription factors, we can uh, obtain, or during dom domestication, larger changes in the phenotype uh, were obtained. So we are particularly interested in the role that um, transcription factors played during domestication. And um, more specifically, we are interested in one transcription factor family, and those are the transcription factors that are encoded by so-called Madsbox genes. So um, this family of transcription factors really uh, controls multiple aspects of plant development. So this here is an image uh, of uh, the Arabidopsis life cycle, and you can see what, what is shown here are matchbox genes that are uh, playing a role during different stages of development during Arabidopsis. So, and you can see it's important, matchbox genes are important during flower development, controlling floral organ identity, but they're also important for seed development, flowering time control. So whatever the developmental process is, matchbox genes play a key role in many of those developmental processes. But beyond being important developmental regulators, those genes also have played uh, an important role during plant domestication. And we tried to illustrate that here in this overview. So what this shows is a generic, uh, a generic flowering plant. And um, what, we, uh, what we've indicated here are different instances where Madsbox genes played a role during the domestication of different plants. Okay, and you can see there are multiple instances where we can find examples of Madsbox genes being important for domestication. And one, uh, I think one relatively, um, well, famous uh, 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 example are, is the seedlessness in grapes. So seedless grapes, uh, are brought about by a mutation in, in a matchbox gene uh, called seed stick. Um, another uh, uh, prominent example is the control of flowering time in cereals. So the winter and spring type uh, wheat or barley, the difference between the winter and the spring type is controlled mainly by uh, allelic variations 
in Matchbox genes. So uh, together, I think this shows that Matchbox genes are important plant development regulators. They play an important role during domestication. And this is uh, our motivation to, to understand those genes better and to uh, characterize those genes uh, more comprehensively in wheat. Now, one could actually ask why people haven't done that before, right? Matchbox genes have been known for decades. People, people have been working on wheat for decades. But um, of course, there's a reason why, uh, uh, why analysis of, why, why genome analysis in wheat is so complicated. Uh, and one uh, reason for that is that wheat is a polyploid plant. So it's hexaploid. Uh, it originated by hybridization of different ancestors. And the modern bread wheat we have today actually uh, consists of three different subgenomes, A, B, and D, that are contributed from the three different ancestors. And that means for every gene copy we have in a diploid species like Arabidopsis or rice, uh, for, for many gene copies, I should say, we have three copies, so-called homeologs in wheat. So that makes the analysis, of course, more complicated. In addition to that, um, wheat also has a relatively or a pretty large genome. So what we've plotted here is the genome sizes of different uh, species, like uh, Arabidopsis has a genome size of about 130 million base pairs. Drosophila is about the same. Rice has a bit of a larger genome. The human genome is 3 billion base pairs, but the wheat genome actually dwarfs them all. The wheat genome is 16 billion base pairs in size. So what we have with wheat is a huge uh, polyploid genome, and that makes it so difficult to sequence and to analyze. Now, luckily, uh, uh, the IWGSC published a high quality wheat genome sequence uh, very recently in 2018, I think. And uh, so that provided really the foundation for the research uh, that we are presenting today, uh, that provided uh, uh, the information that we can then could take and analyze Matchbox genes in wheat uh, uh, and trying to characterize them further. So what we have done uh, using this genome sequence is trying to first identify all of the Matchbox genes in wheat and to characterize them phylogenetically. And um, the re result of those analyses is shown here in the phylogenetic tree. So this is probably really one of the, but well, it's, only, it's only one image, uh, one tree, but it's uh, one of our core results. So we have identified uh, more than 200 uh, Matchbox genes in wheat, uh, and a subgroup of them is shown here. And uh, what you can see is the wheat genes are here shown in color. And in the phylogenetic tree, what is also included are genes from rice and from Arabidopsis. And I think you can see that for all the big, the wheat genes fall into big subfamilies that are shown in the different colors. But in all of those different subfamilies, we also have rice genes or Arabidopsis genes. So we can identify highly conserved subfamilies in wheat, uh, and we find uh, orthologous genes of those subfamilies also in rice and Arabidopsis. Uh, that is expected, of course, because Matchbox genes are so highly conserved. Um, we can then also use databases to study the expression of those genes. And um, we can look, for example, into the expression of one of those subfamilies here, a gamos. So those agamos-like genes in wheat are expressed in the carpal, also in the stamen a bit, and in the grain. So they're mainly expressed in the flower, in the male and the female reproductive organs. Now that really fits nicely with what we know of, uh, of, of those genes from Arabidopsis, from rice, from other model plants, because those agamos genes are involved in controlling carpal identity stamen identity, seed development. Uh, so it looks as if uh, uh, the expression pattern of those genes is conserved in wheat, 
and that also uh, by inference also the function of many of those genes is probably conserved. So we can also conduct this analysis on a bit of a broader scale. So what you can see here are the different uh, subfamilies uh, and uh, here different tissues, developmental uh, stages, grain, spike, leaf and root. And each of those little squares is basically one gene indicating the expression level of that gene. So yellow means the gene is not expressed, dark blue, uh, we have a strong expression of that gene. Now for MIKC star genes, one subfamily, uh, we actually see that those genes are strongly expressed here in the spike. Now it is known that those genes are involved in pollen development. So it really fits, um, or it is in agreement with the idea that the conservation of those genes, that those genes are functionally conserved and probably also function pollen development in wheat. Um, but we also have other instances where the gene expression doesn't really fit the expectation. The one case is here, the B sister genes. We know from rice, from Arabidopsis, they are involved in ovule development. But some of those B sister genes are not expressed at all in any of the developmental stages. And some are expressed also in vegetative parts of the plant or in the root. So this is surprising, right? And we can also look into those genes uh, in a little bit more detail and look beyond developmental expression. But we can use, um, again, databases and look in, in the expression after uh, exposure to stress. And this is uh, depicted here. So um, we see here a couple of uh, those B sister genes. Um, and uh, what is shown here is, uh, is the expression after infection with Fusarium. Uh, so this is causing Fusarium head blight. This is a, um, so it's a, uh, it's a fungal pathogen that is causing a floral disease. Now, some of those B sister genes are, as we would expect, expressed in the grain specifically. And they, their expression actually doesn't change after Fusarium uh, infection. So this is something we would expect for a developmental regulator. However, uh, other B sister genes, they're actually not expressed at all under control conditions, like those two here but they seem to be upregulated in their expression after Fusarium infection. Okay, so we see here a novel pattern of uh, uh, Matchbox gene expression. They seem to respond to a biotic stress. And that is putatively a case of neofunctionalization of those genes. So maybe, at least we can we hypothesize that, based on this expression pattern, maybe some of those genes have evolved new functions and are now involved in, in pathogen related uh, uh, defense mechanisms. Okay, so we, we have this neo-functionalization or putative neo-functionalization. We can of course also ask how, how was that possible? How did this occur during evolution? And one important uh, mechanism for neo-functionalization is gene duplication. If genes are duplicated, they are free to evolve new functions and they can sub-functionalize or neo-functionalize. Neo and indeed, if we look, if we go back to our phylogenetic tree and look at the tree, we can identify certain subfamilies that have really massively expanded in comparison to, uh, to rice or to Arabidopsis. So here, the, those B sister genes, for example, we have dozens of those B sister genes in wheat, but we have only three in rice. So indicating that indeed, we had massive gene duplications going on in some of those subfamilies, not in all subfamilies, but in some of them. Now, what is the mechanistic, uh, what is the potential mechanistic explanation for those duplications? Um, to, uh, uh, to answer that, uh, it helps to look at the uh, genomic or chromosome landscape of uh, wheat. So what we see here is a wheat chromosome and what is plotted along this chromosome is the recombination frequency along the chromosome and the gene density. 
And what you can see is that uh, especially the ends of the chromosome here and here are really gene dense. So we have a lot of genes there. And there's also increased the recombination frequency at the ends of the chromosome is really, really high. So we have a lot of activity going on at the ends of the chromosome. Now we can take this information and plot uh, the occurrence or the, the genomic location of our matchbox genes and superimpose it on those uh, chromosomal territories. And what we see is that some subfamilies seem to have genes more predominantly at those ends of the chromosome, at those subtelomeric regions, like B sister again or AGL17. Whereas other subfamilies like Agamos, they tend to have genes more in the center of the chromosome. And we can even detect the relationship between the size of the subfamily and the chromosomal location uh, of the genes of the subfamily. Okay, so what you see here is the gene, uh, the number of genes per subfamily, and then the percentage of those genes in located in subtelomeric regions. And we see that larger subfamilies like B-Sister or AGL17 that tend to have a lot of genes, those genes tend to be located predominantly in those subtelomeric regions. Whereas smaller subfamilies, they tend to have uh, uh, no genes in those subtelomeric or fewer genes in those subtelomeric regions. So I think what this illustrates is that those subtelomeric segments are really hot spots for evolution. Uh, a lot of gene duplications are going on uh, uh, and those gene duplications may lead then uh, subsequently to putative neo-functionalizations. Whereas other genes, uh, other subfamilies that may have more conserved core functions like carpal development in case of agamos, uh, they are more located in the center of the chromosome where we don't have a lot of uh, uh, recombination turnover. So with this, uh, I want to, to summarize that part of our results. Um, I hope I have convinced you that Matchbox genes are key players in, in weak development, that they have a conserved expression and, and, and sequence pattern, and that they may have contributed to the success of wheat by neo and subfunctionalization. So uh, uh, we think they're actually good candidates for crop improvement. So in now the title of the talk is also the power of bioinformatics resources. So what we want to do in the second part of the talk is really take a kind of look under the hood. So I don't have a car, so I had to take this RC car and look under the hood of this RC car. So, and see how actually those analyzes were conducted and maybe also to help you to conduct similar analyzes with genes uh, or gene families you are interested in. And for the second part, I'm handing over to Susanne now. Yeah, thank you very much, Rainer. Um, uh, as Rainer already said, uh, the idea between the second part of the webinar was to give you all um, a, uh, an idea on how we actually conducted our analysis. And um, uh, I thought that would be especially a good idea maybe for students that are just starting out working with wheat or that are maybe um, wanting to go more into a uh, bioinformatics direction or maybe for groups that are not directly working with wheat but more want that more as a comparative and uh, species for example or maybe groups that are not uh, that are working more uh, in molecular biology but that are not um, as experienced with bioinformatics so i don't know about you i myself i am a, a molecular bi molecular biologist by training and while i was doing uh, during my, my PhD, I did some kind of molecular evolution as well. However, when I started, when I wanted to get started with this project, I was really overwhelmed and it was like a 
standing in front of a huge wall and I really didn't know kind of where to go, especially um, because my my um, ability to use uh, especially command line based tools and a lot of, of bioinformatics programs are command uh, command line based. Um, my ability with that was really limited at that time and uh, there are loads and loads of different uh, read resources. Uh, so, as I said, the idea for the second half of the webinar was to give you a little bit of an insight on how uh, how we how we actually made our analysis and how we came up with these figures that Rainer just showed in the first half. Um, so, uh, as Rainer already uh, demonstrated, this uh, phylogeny is really kind of our, 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 our core, one of our core findings. Um, but of course, uh, we, we for this for to make to make such a phylogeny, for example, for the gene of interest or relatives of your gene of interest, um, you first of all need to identify all the different um, candidates or relatives in the wheat genome. So you need to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of gene mining and gene identification. Uh, and then we went through a, a filtering and kind of a little bit of a sorting process. And afterwards, we um, we started building the uh, phylogeny. So when you first start, of course, you have all these genes that are very nicely annotated in the uh, IWGSC genome, and that is actually a huge advantage. So if you're not working with a model species or with wheat which, which, that has such a nicely annotated genome, you will need to go ahead, you will need to do your own gene predictions, you will need to um, then categorize these genes, for example, by different domains, to or, or you will need, uh, need to use BLAST extensively or programs like Hammer, but the IWGSC actually has done all this, the, these jobs for you. So actually to identify our, our MEDS, the main transcription factors that we were interested in, what we, what we basically did was we downloaded all the genes and these are already annotated, for example, for their PFAM domain and um, all conserved domains uh, have such a PFAM ID and then we could just go ahead and we could scan through this. An easier way to do that, or um, if you're, especially if you're just starting out, is to use the uh, Wheatmine website. And uh, here you can either search for your genes of interest that you are working with by just, um, and you can create a list uh, from them. Or you can also search for GO categories, um, and uh, uh, or for, for for different terms that you are interested in. So this is what the website looks like. I've always I try to provide always the um, uh, the, uh, the the links the links below, and um, you you can uh, you 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 just basically search for what you're interested in, and you have uh, in this database in integrated the IWG uh, reference sequences, the gene models, and transposable elements markers and RNA data. So basically, if I put in now my, my PFAM identifier for, um, for Madsbox genes, um, then uh, it, it, it will actually give me a list I can uh, of, of genes. I can create lists from that, or I can just put in specifically the genes that I'm interested in. And then uh, I can supplement this table with lots of different information, for example, the chromosome uh, number and position, the length of the gene, the PFAM domain, or something like gene ontology identifiers, uh, and many, many more. So I can curate basically all the information that I need to process then, that then later. And I can also download all the, the um, all the sequences of my genes in faster format, which will be very handy when I want to go ahead and build my phylogeny. Ensemble Plants is also a really great tool that I use uh, a lot for uh, for um, uh, looking at wheat genes. So you can uh, actually there you can go ahead and you can annotate your the location of your wheat gene in the genome. Uh, you can also look in depth into the um, transcript structure or the gene structure of your gene, and you can download um, the protein uh, sequence. And what it also, uh, what is also a very powerful tool in my, uh, in my opinion, is that you can, uh, by using the gene tree function, that you can um, identify the wheat, uh, the homeologs of your gene. So if you, I put in, I put in this gene here, but it will actually give me a phylogenetic tree with the two other uh, homeologs, 
and I can also see that I have homologs, uh, homologous genes from other flowering plants, not only grasses. Uh, what I can also do here is to download my FASTA sequences and again this will help me very much when I want to build a phylogeny because very often of course I don't want genes just from one species but from many species. Um, if you want to go ahead and export even more data, Ensemble also has the Biomart tool um, and there you can uh, export uh, the uh, information for a lot of genes in parallel. So back to our project here, we had now all our MET, uh, our MET domain transcription factors and we actually uh, were wondering maybe there are some genes that haven't been annotated yet, maybe we were missing some MET boxes here. So we did an additional blast and basically supplemented this, um, uh, this group of genes. And um, Matsbox genes have a little bit of a, uh, or yeah, they, they come in two different kind of flavors. So we call them type one and type two. These are evolutionary, very distinct groups. So basically what we did, uh, we did, uh, we used the phylogenetic approach to sort for those genes that we thought were especially interesting. The, we call them MIKC type genes just because of their domain structure. To to, to do this phylogeny, we uh, we use MAFT. So MAFT is just one of many different uh, programs that you can use to build alignments. Uh, it's my favorite one. I really like to use it. It is you can, it is a program that you can download and you, you can use on your computer uh, via command line. But you can also um, uh, it also has an online version. Uh, where you just put in your uh, your sequences in faster format and you get build a really nice phylogeny or a really nice alignment uh, and they also have trees, uh, uh, tree functions in, incorporated in there. Uh, we, you have many different settings here uh, and um, one algorithm is specifically su well suited for protein sequences or DNA sequences that have two distinctly um, uh, conserved domains, which is true for, for our type of MATS domain transcription factor that we um, that we were looking at. So I decided to use um, this algorithm. And um, what is also what also comes in very handy is the merge function in MAFT, which you can see here. So basically what you can do is you can build alignments for your different subfamilies, for example, and then you can combine them into one uh, bigger alignment. To calculate the actual tree, we used IQ tree. This is a maximum likelihood method, which is a bit more advanced than your standard neighborhood joining tree. And it is, uh, it is again, uh, also uh, web-based. So all you need to do is you need to provide your, your alignment in faster format and you upload it. And they even, uh, they have a really good um, model test program uh, also in integrated so that you can find the correct evolutionary uh, model for that. After, base, after, uh, after this basically phylogenetic um, sorting, when, what I did, I, I, had my, uh, I had my candidate genes, but I, then I went back and I, were, I did a bit of manual curating because not all of the genes looked quite right. So we, here we have a really big advantage that we had already been working with MATS domain transcription factors before, and there is a lot known about these types uh, of, of proteins or genes. Um, so I went uh, ahead and um, and scanned all the all the genes for their domains and checked whether the the um, the, the domains were present. And um, uh, if that wasn't the case, or if the, the uh, if the gene structure looked a little bit suspicious, then uh, I used this tool, uh, this software here by Softberry F Genes H, to basically um, predict the gene uh, or, pre pre uh, or or improve on the prediction of the gene. Uh, the uh, upside of this program is again, again, it is browser-based, and you do not only provide the algorithm with your uh, chromosomal sequence, but also with a protein sequence of a protein that you think is very um, closely related to the gene that you want to annotate. And um, this is, has the advantage that uh, that the algorithm basically knows what to what to look for. And um, uh, 
this is one of the output files here uh, and you can see we have the coding sequence and the protein sequence um, uh, provided in the output. Uh, here is the gene structure and as you can see this is a gene which has a really unusually large first intron so it's over 45,000 um, bases long this intron and these genes were actually annotated or this gene was actually annotated as two different genes. So the MADS box was pre predicted here and then we had our K box back here, but these were two separate genes. But if you, uh, by using this program, we could actually um, predict this as one gene. And now you might wonder whether that is uh, actually valid. So we were wondering the same. So, so what, what uh, one of our uh, co-authors did, he uh, went back into the lab and did RT-PCR um, on cDNA from wheat, and we could actually get a, uh, a product which showed that we have actually a cDNA which goes from here all the way to here. So this is actually a, a valid gene which is actually expressed in the wheat genome or from the wheat genome. So now we had our set of curated um, MIKC type uh, Matsbox genes. Um, those were turned out to be, to be uh, just over 200 and um, together with the rice and Arabidopsis genes, just to get a little bit of an orientation on which subclade we are in, uh, we used this um, to, to build another tree using MAFT and IQ tree again. And to visualize this tree, I use Genius uh, and uh, I, I also use FigTree. Genius is a program you have to, uh, you have to pay for, uh, for the license, uh, but FigTree is completely free and it is just as easy to use. Uh, what we also found was, and, and Rainer, uh, Rainer talked about that a little bit already in the first part of the talk, was that some of the, the subfamilies were um, uh, were enlarged or expanded. So basically then I, I just did some basic counting and statistical tests and I just used um, Excel and, and uh, a little bit of, of, of R for that. But uh, yeah, this is th these are actually uh, analysis that can give relatively good insight but, that, but they are not requiring a huge um, knowledge of bioinformatics. Um, but uh, then I don't know, so I don't know about, about you, but I personally uh, really uh, enjoy uh, these kind of circus plots, as you can see here from the original genome publication. And uh, these circus plots are, uh, there, pro there are many programs for that, how, uh, with, with what you can um, build those. However, a lot of those are either, either you have to pay for them or um, you have to actually be uh, able to use a little bit of Perl for them, uh, so which I, I wasn't very comfortable doing, but I found um, one uh, software, which is an R Shiny application, and they uh, basically where what you, uh, they also have a, a, web, a web server where they, provide, um, where they provide this kind of service. And what you do is basically you upload all your genome information and the information of the position of your genes and so on, so on, whatever you want to annotate. And here, all this data mining that we did earlier uh, really comes in, in handy. And after, well, I won't say a few clicks, but after some clicks, you, you um, actually end up, or you can end up with, with a really nice figure like this, where you have, on, at one glance, you, you have all the genes that you have identified uh, and you can even, uh, yeah, make make connections or where where um, uh, there were maybe there were some was some re recombination uh, events. Of course, what you also want to do if you want to look into one specific gene family is you want to look into the expression data. And Rainer elaborated a little bit uh, about that also in the first part. Uh, and for that, you first need to of course have the data, and then you need to visualize that. And for wheat, you're actually also, again, really lucky to work with wheat because there is a huge abundance of RNA-seq data, which is publicly available uh, for wheat. So um, something that you can use when uh, you are just working with a few genes that you are interested in, but you want to, uh, for example, say for, downward, uh, for downstream experiments, for qPCR and so on, you need to know where 
are they actually expressed the most in the wheat plant. Uh, I really highly recommend checking out the wheat EFP browser from BAR. And um, this gives a really nice visualizations wherever your gene is expressed. And um, another tool that you can use, which actually there's a, there's a free trial for this tool, but afterwards you have to pay for that, is a Gene Investigator. However, they have, again, a huge abundance of different, uh, of different samples and diff different tissues so that you can have something like uh, a, de a developmental time course for your gene of interest and when in the life cycle it is actually expressed or for example in which tissue it is expressed and also which with which different uh, under 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 uh, different stressors for example here you can see under biotic stress an infection of uh, fusarium these genes for example in this example they are down regulated um the downside of gene investigator is that you cannot directly download uh, the raw data however all most of the raw data I believe that they use is actually publicly available. But for um, getting a feel of how your how your gene is expressed, this is actually a very um, useful uh, useful resource, and also for gene identification. Some uh, or one resource that was really very valuable for us was wheatexpression.com, and um, we uh, they also have uh, a lot of RNA seq. Uh, uh, different RNA seq um, experiments in their database, not only de developmental and tissue based, but also um, different, uh, again, different stressors, abiotic stressors, biotic stressors, and so on. So you can see under which circumstances your gene might be up or down regulated. The upside here is that all the raw data can also be downloaded, but you can also just export. Um, an image of your heat map that you have created with this tool. If you want to work with your with your expression data further, you uh, there's the, uh, you want may, might want to uh, build a heat map. And one um, tool that I really like for that is a heat mapper. There are um, I think dozens and dozens of different programs for for building these heat maps and for doing clustering analysis. However, I think this is a Again, very available tool um, where you just have to, uh, this browser based, and you just have to upload your, your, your uh, expression data in a table format. Another tool that we uh, used actually for the, uh, um, uh, for the paper itself is the, is the Morphos Heap Mapper um, from the Broad Institute, which, is, which works in very, in, in very similar ways. There are many other uh, resources for wheat. Again, I can't stress enough. It is very, especially if you're just uh, starting out, for example, with your PhD or with your master thesis, and you were um, digging a little bit more into the, the function of your gene, or maybe you're working on a related species like uh, Hodeum, then you uh, might be interested in what the gene is actually doing in wheat. Of very often, these functions are very are, are highly conserved, and so. Um, I, I, I highly recommend if you don't know them to check them out. So the the um, the J browser from from the IWGSC is really good. You have a lot of tracks that are annotated there, including SNP data and so on. Um, if you want to look into synteny and where uh, and microevolution um, of your gene in regards to other grass species, I highly recommend um, looking into this. And Ensemble Plants actually has an abundance of, of other tools that you can use, for example, also for synteny, and you can also look into EMS mutants, wheat EMS mutants that are in seed banks. And you can, what you can also do is you can uh, look into the wheat progenitor uh, sequen genome sequences and um, look for, uh, for, for similar sequences. Some other resources that I use basically on a daily basis is, of course, NCBI. There are, uh, there's an abundance of tools, like, for example, BLAST or the Conserved Domain Database, different databases for all kinds of different species. Of course, not only wheat, not only plants, but uh, basically all, uh, all, the, all, all genomes are, are also there. Our studio is something that I uh, rec recommend checking out if you are uh, if you want to go more into bioinformatics and you want to uh, warm up a little bit to, to programming maybe, and you're 
uh, it is it makes it really easy to start uh, using R. Um, uh, I have already talked about MAFT and IQ tree, and uh, I highly recommend if you want to work with with next generation sequencing data, but you are not very comfortable with command line based tools, to look into the Galaxy platform, which is again a free uh, web web based service for an analyzing. Um, next generation sequencing data. What I also recommend, uh, highly recommend is whenever you are stuck somewhere, either you can ask Google or you go directly to YouTube, you would not believe how many people have made tutorial and have uh, tutorials and videos that uh, are incredibly helpful for certain specific uh, questions or tasks that you want to do. Uh, you can actually teach yourself quite a bit with that and also um, with, with uh, using using forums uh, because I promise you if you want to do an analysis somebody else has tried that before and had a similar problem uh, like so often when you when it comes to bioinformatics it's just um, basically problem uh, problem solving and, and, and error uh, just chasing errors down. Uh, ADX and and, and uh, and the AMBL, they have also lots of lots of online courses that, that you can take if you want to improve one specific skill. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I also want to thank, thank the IWGSC to give us the opportunity to talk uh, to talk today. And I also want to thank our uh, co-authors, Siri and Alice. They are students that have worked with us on the project. And Lars, he is an actual bioinformatician, and I've learned a lot from him. And he uh, has helped tremendously with the phylogenetics analysis. So with that, um, I think we are now happy to take your questions. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Reimer and uh, Suzanne, I, for an excellent uh, webinar. I think the way you laid it out was very good because you dealt with the issue of what you were after. Plus, you know, Suzanne, your presentation really took it from coming into such a complex genome and what are all the things that you can do to, to get there. Uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them into the uh, questions box. And I will say that everyone's questions will be answered, not necessarily in the few minutes we have remaining on our webinar, but you will receive an answer to the questions uh, <clears throat> one by one. But at the moment, I'm going to ask a, a few questions that have come up during the presentation. In which subgenome were the MADS box genes prominently found, or was there a subgenome preference? Should I answer that? Do you want to answer? So, yeah, so uh, I think, so we, we didn't do a specific analysis on that as far as I remember, but there wasn't anything particularly obvious that one subgenome would be particularly enriched in matchbox genes as opposed to other subgenomes. So um, what we actually find is that the homeolog retention rate is relatively high. So um, for 60%, I think, of the genes uh, around, we have actually three homeologs. So we have three co one copy in each of the subgenomes. What is unusually high if you compare it to the average homeolog retention rate, but may indicate that those genes are really important developmental regulators and can't easily be lost. But I don't think there was any prevalence of one particular subgenome. Yeah, we actually found that there were that uh, there was a little bit there were a little bit more genes on just on chromosome seven. This was just because there seemed to be some tandem, tandem duplication going on in one particular gene family. So this the all three chromosome sevens had a higher abundance of Metzbox genes. But I think, as I said, like the, you could trace those back to single to single duplication events. Um, but yeah, as Rainer said. Um, we found actually there was there was it was relatively balanced between the three genomes, and we found this high uh, retention rate. So the next question is: What is the fate of Madbox genes in vegetative parts such as the root? Um, yeah, maybe I take this. Uh, so Madbox genes are uh, involved in 
all key developmental um, aspects of plant uh, of plant uh, development in the plant life cycle. There are certain subfamilies that are predominantly expressed in the root, for example, AGL12-like genes or AGL17-like genes. Those are known, uh, especially from, from rice, but also from Arabidopsis and other species, to have a, a role in uh, in root development or in uh, also in uh, stress response if you think about nutrients i think uh, there's a lot of evidence especially in rice that agl17 like genes are um, involved in stress response when it comes to low phosphorus and uh, and, and things like this so um, not all mad subfamilies are expressed in the root or have a role in the root but uh, there are particular uh, Med subfamilies that are involved in root development and also root stress response. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Is there a way that you can check for the recombination rate? Mm, uh, that's I, I'm not sure. Probably yes, um, but I would ha I would have to look that up. Rainer, do you have any? Well, I mean, I think the recombination rate is measured, right? So there are publications on that uh, uh, studying how high the recombination rate across the chromosome is. So um, those data exist uh, from mapping populations, I presume. Um, the the uh, higher gene density in on the chromosome ends, I think that is a result of the evolutionary history uh, that in the past, I don't know, thousands of years, the recombination rate has been high at those uh, chromosome ends. And with that, also a higher likelihood of gene duplication comes. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> by using genotyping by sequencing, we can go for a phylogenetic study of Mads box genes and wheat or any other research going on, but how do you find the using genotyping by sequencing technology to find different types of Mads box genes in the wheat crop. Not completely sure I understand that question, but. Yeah, for me, genotyping by sequencing is more like a SNP based approach just to see whether you have SNPs in, in, the, whole, in the whole genome, but it's not targeting one specific Gene, as far as I as as far as I know, is you it is something that you use for mapping, for example. Um, I think what what would be really interesting uh, is to go now that we have a general understanding of um, of wheat uh, of wheat matchbox genes, and to now go into different wheat genomes which are available and see whether actually the say the wheat the MADS pan genome of wheat is different. Maybe different varieties of wheat have different sets of MADS box genes. And I think there's, for example, one um, vernalization one like gene, which is only present in a certain subset of, I think, Australian wheat. Uh, so this, uh, this MADS box gene that Rainer was talking about, which is actually distinguishing between spring and winter wheat, there seems to be like an additional copy of this gene in certain subsets of, of, of uh, wheat cultivars. Um, I'm, uh, as I said, as we, we haven't looked into that too specifically because there's only so much that you can do, but I think that would be really interesting to look into kind of wheat pan genomes to see whether the sets of uh, MADS domain transcription factors differ between different lines. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Is the response to biotic stress a novel function for MADS transcription factors, or are there any previously known MADS genes that respond to biotic stress? Zane, do you want to, or should I answer no. that? Go ahead. So um, I think so traditionally, the function of Mads box genes is more uh, uh, during plant development. Uh, so there are genes known to be involved in abiotic stresses, but as far as I know, there are not many or maybe no examples where really a function in biotic stress response has been documented. So uh, of course, uh, what we identified here is only a kind of circumstantial evidence that they may be involved in this biotic stress rep response. Um, uh, that would be something that we need to look into in the future. 
And uh, uh, so I think, so given that, for example, those B-sister genes are originally expressed in the ovule, in the flower, there is a possibility that they have been co-opted into a pathogen response mechanism or, or defense against the floral pathogen. But of course, that would require functional assays to really validate that. Great, thank you. So we've had several questions regarding the RNA-Sec data. Could you elaborate a little more of how to use RNA-Sec data directly from the projects of NCBI or EBI? In, in specific case, what treatments to look into? Um, that very much depends on the gene that you are interested in, I think. So, uh, but there are different levels to that, I would say. So, if you work with other species where there's maybe RNA-seq data, raw data available, but um, this data has only been de only been de this deposited maybe to the NCBI SRA, the, sequ the, the sequence repository, then you have to download this and you have to do your own mapping and analysis and um, differential expression analysis or whatever you want to do. With wheat, I think the, the, the huge advantage is that you don't even need to be able to do that. You just go to the, to the database. And what my approach to that was, I looked at all my genes that I was interested in, in basically in all conditions. I just sat down for a couple of hours and just looked through uh, through all these heat maps that you can relatively easily generate. And all these tools, for example, weedexpression.org has a really good documentation as well. So you can, um, it can be a little bit tricky in the beginning to figure it out, but once you have gotten the hang of it, then it's relatively easy to look through different, say, for example, developmental stages and uh, different um, stress conditions. And I would approach that, it, again, it depends on what, what you're working at, uh, but for example, I, I wouldn't approach it from uh, too kind of a biased angle because if we had taken this biased approach, we wouldn't, we would have probably overlooked these um, B sister genes that had a response to uh, in biotic stress because we hadn't expected this. So if you are only looking for what you already know, then you can also might also be missing that. If that is of any help, if you want to do actual RNA seq data analysis because maybe the sample that you are interested in is not in one of the read databases that I showed. Uh, I highly recommend to go uh, to use galaxy.org, uh, the resource that I, I, I mentioned uh, in my last slide. This is a, a hugely important tool in my daily life. I, um, they give you uh, a, a storage and computing power and uh, you have an abundance of tutorials that you could look into on how to uh, access data, how to do quality control on the sequencing data, and how to then uh, do mapping, uh, SNP analysis, whatever you want to do, or uh, RNA-seq and so on. So yeah, it depends on kind of what resource you have and what, what database you're looking into. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend that you uh, find yeah, what's, what's suitable for, for, for your gene or for your approach. Great, thank you very much. Well, we've run out of time at this point. There are a lot of other questions that will be answered. And again, I'd like to invite you to participate in our next webinar as well. And to thank, we want to thank Reiner and Suzanne for a great presentation today. And please let us know if you, there's a particular topic that you'd like for us to try to cover in one of our webinars, and we will try to find a person to do that. So thank you very much and have a safe and healthy day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. for having Bye. us. Bye. Bye.